Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy. I am the pastor at New Mountain Church, and I'm glad to be here, glad to see all you guys. Uh, we are uh, in Luke 11 still. Uh, we will probably be here for just two more weeks or so. Uh, but uh, this is how we kind of do things at New Mountain Church as we go through the Bible verse by verse and we, we really take out what God has in His Bible. So we, we really uh, go through it and there's a lot of scripture sometimes, but hey, I want to I wanna create a church full of Christians that know their words so much that they can't help but walk out the Christian life. That's really what I want. Uh, I don't need any, uh, any Sunday Christians here. I need seven day a week Christians here. So, uh, but if you don't want to do that, hey, I still love you and I'm glad you're here. So today uh, we are in Luke eleven thirty three through 36. So uh, again, like I said, we go verse by verse. We're what's called the expository church. Uh, and that's just kind of meaning that we're exposing what God has in his word. It's very simple to understand. The New Mountain Church just rests on two pillars, which is we're built on the Bible and we're built for community. So that's why we have a huge emphasis on the Bible and a huge emphasis in community. You know, friendships being born, uh, coming together as a family church, and then reaching outside of our church into the rest of the community out there, hopefully bringing them into this community. So that's what we're all about. Let's jump into the scripture, and this is how we do it here. We stand for the reading of God's word, so let's do that today. Let's stand. This is Luke 11. This is Luke 11, starting at verse 33. It says this, No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body, and when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for your word today, Lord. I pray that you'd be with us today, that you'd help us to understand, Lord. Help us to be illuminated and help us to see. So, Lord, we thank you so much. We pray that you'd bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. I titled this sermon today, Eye Test. Has anybody ever been to the eye doctor? Yeah? And they, last week, yeah. They make you look at all these different things and they shine lights in your eyes and it's a big, it's a big deal, you know. Well, I, this is what I think that this section of Scripture is talking about is our spiritual eye test. You know, it says this in Luke eleven thirty three. 33, if we were to look back at the first verse that we looked at, it says, No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Uh, it's pretty, you know, hard for us to even grasp this because nowadays we have this thing on the wall. It's called a light switch, and we just flick it, and it turns on. Back in these days, they didn't have none of that. So if your lamp wasn't working, or if you're hiding your lamp in whatever way, no light. Everybody is in darkness. And so it was a big deal. But this is the thing. This is the thing is that this sounds a lot like the other gospels where Jesus says the same thing about the lamp and not to put it under a basket, not to hide it, not to put it in a cellar. But this section is where Jesus is using that same metaphor for himself. So let's look at this. This is C.H. Spurgeon. He's an old school English preacher, the prince of preachers from back in the day. He says this. He says, some saw his brightness, some did not. And others thought the light wasn't bright enough and demanded to see more. Our Lord's constant answer was to go on shining. He was meant to be observed, even as a lamp is intended to be seen. What we see here, what we're looking at here, is the fact that this has been a theme with all, some of the people that are following Jesus around. Some of them are saying, Oh, Jesus, you're doing all these miracles. You're doing all these things. You must be doing it by the power of the devil. And then there's other people there that are saying, oh, I'm not so sure. I need to see more evidence. I need to see more miracles. I need to see more signs, Jesus. I'm just not sure. I 
am just not seeing it. And so this is why Jesus is saying this kind of stuff. He says, no one after, after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket. He's saying that the miracles that he's done has been wide out in the open, that everybody could see it. In fact, there's a verse in John that talks about that it was uh, such a huge amount of works that Jesus did, such a, a mighty amount of miracles that he did that nobody could deny it, but yet people still did. Now, it's like this. Matt, do you have a light on your cell phone, the flashlight? So Matt Fox is going to be Jesus Christ right now. Okay. Go, Matt. So, so, so the light is shining. I don't know if you can see it. Show everybody your, your light. Yeah. This is what they do at concerts now. Instead of lighters, they hold up cell phones. You know? But this is, this is Matt Fox, a.k.a. Jesus. And the light is shining, and you can all see the light. But what I would have to do to not see it is to say, well, you know, I just can't see. Oh. And then this is my wife's. These are my wife's glasses, by the way. That's why they look so great on me. So the light's shining, but yet I block it a little bit, right? Okay, so what about Jesus getting a little bit closer? Then what? If you stand up and kind of come close to me. The light's coming closer. Miracles are happening more often or in my vicinity. And, oh, the light is close. Okay. Okay. I just can't see it. I can't see it. This is what happens spiritually. Thank you, Jesus. This is what happens spiritually, is that the light is shining, but we block it. The light is getting closer and undeniable, but yet we shield it. Huh. This is something that we need to look at. This is something we need to be careful of because uh, there's really only two groups of people in this whole world. There's no different colors. There's no different nationalities. All there are are those who trust Jesus and those who don't. That is it. That is it. And so... We look at Spurgeon again, one more time. He says this, If you do not see Jesus, it is not because he has hidden himself in darkness, but because your eyes are blinded. This is where we need to have a spiritual eye test done. Okay, let's keep going. Let's look at this next quote I have. Jesus, he has the ultimate clarity. Jesus is pure. Jesus is Perfect. This is what George H. Morrison, he's an old Puritan from back in the day, he said this. He said, he saw the kingdom in a mustard seed and the adoring woman in a harlot. He saw the solid rock in Simon and the lover in the son of thunder. He saw a, in a child the citizen of heaven, in a bit of bread his broken body, in a cup of common wine his sacred blood, never was a vision such as this, because never was there a nature such as this. Jesus was perfect, and the way Jesus sees you is perfect. It's clear. There's no fogginess, there's no haziness in the way Jesus sees you. Problem is, is that we see ourselves sometimes askew where we see ourselves maybe higher and greater than we really are. Or maybe some of you in here see yourself as lower than you really are. And you beat yourself up and you talk bad about yourself and you feel depressed. But I wonder, what if we were to see not only God truly and clearly, not only Jesus with clarity, but yet we were able to see ourselves as who we are that we are loved, that we are forgiven. As believers in Christ, we are made new. We are made alive, Ephesians. We are uh, in the family, adopted into the family of God. But I say this every once in a while. We as Christians today don't walk that way. We're full of anxiety and depression, and we're full of uh, self-hatred, and, and, and we're full of just uh, fogginess and cloudiness in life i pray that we would push away the fog we don't have no smoke machines here just to let you know because i don't need any fog i need some clarity in this room okay so 
We see this in the other Gospels, the same kind of idea, the same kind of phrasing. But Jesus is using it for the disciples in the other Gospels where he says this. He says, you are the light of the world. He says that in Matthew 5. Or he says this, he says in Luke 8, he says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar, but puts it or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter the house may see the light. Talking about the gospel, talking about the disciples sharing Jesus. But at this section of Luke, this is Jesus saying that he is the light. He is the light of the world. This is the context that we're in. Okay, well, let's look at the gospel of John real quick for a second. John 12, 35 through 36, it says, So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. He says, Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. Who's the light? Jesus. Jesus. Not Matt Fox. Jesus. <laughs> just, to, just to be sure we know that. You're a good guy, but you're not Jesus. Okay. This many signs that Jesus did, many miracles that he said, in Greek it's called tosada. It's it's a large amount of miracles. In fact, there's another part of Scripture that says that if everything that Jesus did was recorded, uh, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to con- hold them. Okay, Jesus did many things. So it's not a lack of signs. It's not a lack of light. It's blindness in people. The works and the words of Jesus are what has gone forth into the world. The words and the works... It's like gang signs, right? The words and the works. See, Jesus has no hidden light in him. No hidden light. Everything Jesus did was in public. Miracles. Casting out demons. Preaching the kingdom of God. It was all public. Now, his time with his disciples, that was private. That was perfect. That was friendships. That was was in, in community together. And that was deep. That was for the edification of them. Whenever he's bringing it to the world, he's showing it to everybody. In John 1, 9, it says this, the true light, which, gave, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. In John 12, 46, it says, I have come into the world as light, so whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. John 9, 5 says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And this is why we has, we've titled this this. Uh, multi-year long series light of the world because this is what the main point of luke is is showing us that jesus christ is the light of the world can you imagine what would happen if our sun went out can you imagine what would happen to our nation to our world crops dying uh no more light, depression. depression. Yeah, that's why uh, Seattle, I heard that a long time ago, Seattle was a pretty bad place for depression because of the cloudiness always. It would be a big deal. And so when we look at light, light is what brings us power. Light is what brings us illumination. Light is what brings us truth. So we can look at this, Luke eleven thirty four 34 through 35, where he says, this is Jesus kind of switching it. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. This light in us is when we have Jesus in us. When Jesus is someone that we're worshiping, someone that we're following. When Jesus is our King, we can't help but walk like the King. We can't help but Talk like the king. So, if you have your Bibles, we're a big big Bible church. Not a big Bible. Rob back there has a big Bible. That's like that thick, you know. (laughs) But we are big on the Bible at this church. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn to John 9. It's not going to be up on the screen. John 9. Let's look at this for a second. John 9. This is where Jesus heals a man that was born blind. Verse 1, as he passed by, he saw a man, blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, uh, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that the man sinned or his parents, but 
that the works of God might be displayed in him. This is the point of the healing. This is the point of the guy being able to see is that the works of God will be displayed in him. When you go into a convenience store or you go into a shopping mall, you, go, you ladies, you go to a makeup counter. They have a display there with lights in it. Why? So you can see the product, right? This, his, his work is on display. His work is being seen. Now these, these Pharisees are having a real hard time with this because these Pharisees are saying that, that Jesus is nothing but a sinner. Jesus is not God. Jesus is not the Messiah. This is what they're saying. This is what they're, they're trying to say. And so the Pharisees ask him, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And so again, this is verse 17 of chapter 9. He says, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews, in verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been born or that he'd been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? And his parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. Uh, he is of age. He, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. This is, prob- this is the problem. This is the big problem. Is that this guy can see. This guy can see he was blind since birth, but now he can see, but yet the Jews had already made up their mind about who Jesus was. Let me ask you a question. Have you already made up your mind? I pray that if you have, it's on the fact that he's king, that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. I pray that that's how you've made up your mind, but But many people who are living in spiritual darkness, they're blinded because they already made up their mind about who Jesus is. This is why you can always tell, I don't know if you're into sharing your faith, but I hope that you are into sharing your faith out in the communities, out in the city. I pray that as you share your faith that you would would be able to share the gospel. Well, here's the problem. In sharing the gospel with people or apologetics is how you uh, explain and defend your faith if you are doing that you're going to witness two different types of people talking to you and i'm talking about the people that don't believe you're going to get people who don't believe and they'll talk to you they'll converse with you but they don't want an answer they just want to stump you hmm That's one group. And then the other people who don't believe, as you're discussing with them the things of God or Jesus or the Bible or church history or whatnot, they really want to discuss it and they really want to hear an answer. They really want to work it out. See, those are the people that maybe are not blind. The ones who have their minds made up like these Pharisees are the ones that are blind. So this is where it comes down to us. We, all, we always got to realize that this scripture is written not about us, but it's written for us. So how are we fitting into this? How is our spiritual sight? I pray that it would be good. This is what it says, John 9, 32 to 33. It says, Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opening or anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the fact that they couldn't figure this out. They couldn't work this out. But Jesus is the one who healed the man's sight. So the problem isn't a lack of light. The problem is a lack of sight. Hear me. The problem isn't a lack of light. It's the lack of sight. What do you think happens on a cloudy day for solar panels? It don't work out really great. 
Solar panels take in the sun's rays and convert it to power. Could we be like solar panels as Christians? Could we people that we've taken in the light and now the light is shining through us and we're living in the power of the light by trusting in Christ? Repenting of our sins and trusting in Christ, we are walking in the light, walking in the power, but it only comes from Him. He's the source. Without the sun, a solar panel is nothing but metal and glass and some wires and probably some other components that I don't know about. (laughs) But with the sun, the solar panel is an energy source. Hmm. Okay, let's look at this, Matthew 15, 14. He says, Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. This is where Jesus is now switching, and he's showing how the Pharisees and the leaders of the day were blind guides. They were blind. They couldn't see the truth, even though it was right in front of them. If you were here last week, you would have heard the section of Scripture that we were going through where it said that the queen of the south will rise up and condemn the people of that generation. And it said that the Ninevites would rise up and condemn the people of that generation. And we looked at why. It's because the queen of the south, which her name was Sheba, came all the way from Ethiopia, came to Solomon and heard about his wisdom, heard about his truth. And she traveled 1,500 miles just to discuss with him. And it said that she gave him hard questions. She laid it all out for him. And and Solomon answered as best he could. And she glorified God after hearing the answers. Or Jonah, sad little mean little prophet, running through the city of Nineveh saying, you're all going to die. 40 days and it's all over. And that whole town, massive mega town, repented and turned to Christ. See, both Sheba... And those Ninevites, they had a small amount of light. But they responded. These Pharisees have a major amount of light in Jesus Christ. And they denied it. They were blinded to it. Our spiritual sight is a big deal. And so let's look at some of the, some of the ways that Jesus talked about the spiritual leaders of Judea at that time. Matthew 23, he rebukes them. It says this, Matthew 23, 16, they're blind guides. In verse 17, you blind fools. In 19, you blind men. In 24, you blind guides, straining out a gnat, but yet swallowing a camel. <laughs> These guys were blind. Not only blind, but in their blindness... They were rejecting the only true light. Matthew 23, 25 to 26 says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. They were putting on the show. Now this really speaks to me. Because I know a lot of people who act like everything is all hunky-dory. They act like the perfect model Christian, but inside they're as dark as darkness. And I, I'm worried. I'm worried for people who try to put on the show. They clean the outside of the cup, but neglect the inside. Think about, think about what that means. Think about what that means. It says, where Jesus says, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. How we live and how we walk out this Christian life is very, very important. It's very, very important. We have to have a good eye. In the Greek, it's actually talked about a single eye, a single focus, a single determining purpose in life to follow after Jesus. We're not divided. We're not moving into different, you know, trying to split our time, trying to go after something that sounds right or go after something that feels right. But no, could we just go after Christ? Go after Jesus? Could we have a good eye? I hope so. You know, there's a story back in the day 
about a pirate that he was, he, he, he went into a bar. <laughs> you know this is going to be bad right now. A pirate went into a bar and he was upset when he came out of that bar. He was upset because he said the bartender was making fun of him. So this pirate, he's like the pirates in the movies. Peg leg, hook, eye patch. Well, he said that he walked up to the bar, and this, this bar is in Australia. He walked up to the bar, and the bartender said, Good eye, mate. And he pointed at his good eye. <laughs> yeah, did you, where's Foster at? Yeah, play that drum. But this is, the, this is the point, though. How is our eye? Because if our eye is darkened, we can't see. I don't know if you've ever had a, you know, met somebody who has cataracts real bad. If it's foggy, if it's cloudy, they can't see as well. If it's clear, mm, that's a different story. They can see. And I, I think for us, we need to be able to see because the Greek is haplous for single, clear, and I wouldn't say eye, but I would say vision. Single, clear way of looking, way of seeing the light. This is what we need. Now, when Jesus talks about the bad eye, that's poneros. And that's the same word for evil. If our eye is evil, then everything in us will be evil. Hmm, look, look at this. This is another quote. I know I got a bunch of quotes today, but I, sorry, not sorry. J.C. Ryle, he says this. He says, let your Christianity be so unmistakable, your eye so single, your heart so full, your walk so straightforward, that all who see you may have no doubt of whose you are and whom you serve. That is what we should be living like. We should be living like our, our walk is so straightforward. Our heart is so whole and our eyes so single that those people that see us and meet us and talk to us, they can't help but see Jesus in us. So maybe this is a good secondary way to look at our eye test. How do other people perceive you? Now granted, some people are going to not perceive you well. And that's not because of you. That's because of them. But, but on the majority, on the, you know, on the regular... How do people perceive you? Think about that. They, they, they perceive you as somebody who's kind, somebody who's calm or compassionate, somebody who's exciting to be around, somebody who's loving, uh, somebody who takes time, or somebody who's hard-headed. That, that's me. This is what I'm hearing. You know, Hard-headed, somebody who's you know, maybe prideful. Think about it. how are you being seen? It might help us to see how we are being. I don't know. This is what I'm, I'm thinking. The muddy eyes or foggy eyes or cloudy spiritual eyes can really mess us up. Think about this. Muddy eyes. you got mud in the eye. How many of us deal with shame, deal with regret, and so we can't even see God clearly because we're trying to look through our shame to see God? Hmm. How can God love me? I've messed up so bad. How can God forgive me? I've done so many bad things. I've been so many bad places. Do you remember last week we were looking at the people of Nineveh who chopped people's heads off and did all sorts of manner of horrible things to people and yet Jonah preached to them? Just, he just told them that they're going to die, that they're going to be judged. And they all repented Nobody that I've ever met is as bad as a Ninevite. Jesus brings all into the family. It don't matter where you've been, no matter who, who you are, it doesn't matter your shame or your regret, no matter what, he sees through that. But can you? Hmm. Okay. How about this? Infected eyes. Has anybody ever had an infected eye? Or pink eye? Or an eye infection? Or... Something like that. Again, could this also be the same thing spiritually? Where we've been infected. Where we've been definitely deceived. And what is in our eye is what might seem good, but yet is leading towards death. 
Could we be using our eye to look at things that we shouldn't be looking at? If so, realize that none of that stuff goes unseen. Everything you look at, everything you've seen, every website that you shouldn't have been on, it's all an eye infection. And you need medicine. You need Jesus. He's the one that can bring us out of all that. He's the one that can give us a second chance, a second start. He's the one that can cleanse us. It's only Jesus. There's nothing that we can do. I know so many people who just completely reject coming to church because they say, I'm just too bad. No, uh, uh, how about this? Oh, the building will burn down if I walk through those doors. Oh, the walls will fall in if I walk through those doors. Never seen it happen before. I'd say, try it, try it. I mean, if so, it'd be pretty cool to watch, but... No, 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 that's not going to happen because no matter how bad you are, no matter how much sin you have or how much sin you're committing right now, Jesus can give you a second chance. He can give you a second start. He can take the sin from you. This is the good news. On our own, we can't sometimes get rid of sin. And that's why total submission and trust in Jesus Christ can free us from the bondage of sin. But you have to trust. You have to follow. You have to walk after Him. He's not just a special prayer that you prayed one time. He's a king that you follow. In order to be a Christian, in a sense, it is saying that you are leaving the army of darkness and signing up for the army of light on the dotted line. This is what it means to be a Christian. To where now you are held to that. To where you need to walk like that and talk like that and dress like that and live like that. This is what it means to be a Christian. And I pray for us, if we have muddy eyes, I pray that we would look through that shame and that regret and we'd see Jesus clearly as he sees us clearly. If our eyes are infected by sin and the devil, I pray that we would reject it, we would repent of our sins, we would trust Christ But here's the next thing. We've seen muddy eyes, we've seen infected eyes, but what about damaged eyes? Let me tell you a story. This is a true story. And I was crying just like that baby. When I was a kid, little kid, my mom had a clothesline. Any of your moms have clotheslines in the backyard? Okay. So I figured out, me and my brothers, we figured out this awesome thing to do. My mom had the little bag, you know, attached to the line with the, all the clothes pins, right? Well, I found out that if you take that clothes pin and you go around right into the middle of the line where the pole and the pole and the line going across it, if you go to the middle and you put the pin over the top of it and you pull down as hard as you can, bam, you can fling that pin way up into the sky. And we would do that, and we'd run, you know, because we're going to get hit with a pin as it comes down. Um, And then we started to get the idea, well, what if we were to pull it down, but yet pull it to the side as well, and fling it into our neighbor's yard and hit their, you know, cat or something. Well, I did that, and I just wanted to see, I just wanted to see how it looked as it came off the line. (laughs) And I, don't, I, am, I, am, I was not a smart child, and I'm not a smart adult. But I, I looked at it, let it go, bam, hit me right in the eyeball. And like, I had to go to the hospital for it, and the doctor's like, you almost lost your eye for doing that. You know. Damaged eye. Could many of us have a damaged eye? where we were following after a bad theology that has led us down a dark road. I hope that's not the case in here today. Our our theology is very important. We need to examine ourselves. We need to see how how is our theology, how is the way we believe lining up in Scripture? That's what it all comes down to, is does it line up in Scripture, in God's holy word? If not, then you need to ditch it. If you have a tradition 
that you just you know you think that that's just how church should be and that's how church should look well if it's not in scripture ditch it get rid of it we need to fully and truly hold to scripture because this is god's infallible word Theanostas, that's the Greek. It's breathed out by God. This is very, very important stuff. He, now, now here, okay, now listen. I don't want to be that kind of pastor, that kind of church that just constantly offends people, but I'm probably going to offend some people right now. But just in case, we do got shirts that are going to be, be being made. I was triggered at New Mountain Church. So if you get triggered today, uh, you got a shirt coming in the mail. Anybody like the Beatles? Okay, okay, the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. The Beatles were a great band, but, but man, in some of their songs, there's some horrible theology. How about the song Imagine, right? Remember that song? Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell. And what did he say? No religion either, or something like that. Or how about George Harrison, you know, guitar player from the Beatles? Uh, after uh, you know, fame had got to his head and fame had really started to burden him, he started looking for something more. And so he didn't find God. What he found was Hare Krishna. And so he wrote this song called My Sweet Lord. And in this song, towards the end, he starts saying hallelujah, hallelujah. But then after a while, it turns from hallelujah into Hare Krishna. And he's trying to show that maybe there's many ways to God. Hare Krishnas are just an offshoot of Hinduism. They're pantheists, meaning they have pan, a whole bunch of gods. And so what he's saying is actually a mahu mantra where he's telling everybody and teaching everybody that maybe Jesus is not the only way. Or how about Oprah? If any of you like Oprah in here, repent! Just joking. (laughs) Oprah... She had this, uh, this guy, and he's a very famous philosopher, Deepak Chopra. Uh, he had a book that he wrote that's called The Third Jesus. <sighs> you know who he was saying is the third Jesus? You. Find the Jesus inside you that is you. It says, he says, this is a quote from him, Let yourself be your higher guide. I mean, for the Christian, we have Jesus in us. But we don't let ourselves be the higher guide. That's how you get cults. We don't want cults. The Scripture is our highest guide. Jesus Himself is our highest guide. We listen to the Spirit of God. That's how we do it. This is how we do it. John 16, 13 says this, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. That is the guiding that takes place. Or how about Jesus in Luke 1, 71? This is Jesus. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, or Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. We are to be guided by God's word. We are to be guided by Jesus Christ. We are not to be guided by false theology that damages our spiritual eye. Islam says that Jesus is just a prophet. He's not God. Mormonism, through the angel Moroni, Joseph Smith, gets this picture that Jesus is brothers with Satan. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus at one time was Michael the Archangel. Scientology, this is L. Ron Hub- Hub- Hubbard. I remember, do you guys remember that when there used to be the infomercial from back in the day? Yeah. L. Ron, new book from L. Ron Hubbard. Well, L. Ron Hubbard was a failed science fiction writer, and he wrote that Jesus was just an implanted program in our psyche. Okay, how about Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science? (laughs) It's foggy light. It's cloudy light. I even worry about the Seventh-day Adventists. Helen G. White, she would hold 
they would hold her writings up at the same level as Scripture. That's, that's dangerous stuff. And even my Roman Catholic friends, I love my Roman Catholic friends. My dad's even Roman Catholic. But at the same time, the, there's traditions in that church that are not biblical. We have to be people who are biblical we have to be a church that's on fire. We have to be a church full of truth, a church that can see truth, and a church that rejects darkness. We are soldiers of light, and we are in a battle. I say this almost every Sunday. There are no sidelines in Christianity. There is no such thing as warming the bench in Christianity. You're in the fight, and you're fighting, and it's going to be hard. But we're winning. We are Christians. The end is already written. Satan is already defeated. What we're doing is we're defeating now. We're putting an end to now. And as Jesus comes back, he will put an end to darkness once and for all. And it kind of reminds me of Revelation 3.17, where Jesus is talking to the church in Laodicea. And then the church in Laodicea, they have a bad problem going on because they are lukewarm. They're halfway in, halfway out. They can kind of see, they kind of can't. <laughs> and this is what Jesus says to them. Uh, this is Revelation 3, 17. He says, for you say I am rich. Well, the church in Laodicea was a very rich church in a very rich town. Jesus says, you say you're rich. I have prospered. I need, I need nothing. See, this city that I'm talking about used to be able to... Actually, anybody use Visine in here today? Nobody uses... I'm the only weirdo that uses Visine. Okay. Well, the, some of the ingredients in Visine came from the city of Laodicea. They were the first to make an eye salve that, would, that you'd put in the eye and it would clear up eye issues kind of funny but they also made wool and other stuff and so they were a very very rich town and jesus says not realizing that you are wretched pitiable poor blind and naked they thought they're rich jesus says spiritually spiritually you're poor oh they thought that they thought that they could see they, they even make eye salve for people. Jesus says, you're blind. They say, well, I mean, but, but we make wool. And we make, they made black wool. They made great clothing. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're naked. You think you're all that, but you're not. You think you can see, but you can't. You think you're rich, but you're actually poor. Luke eleven thirty three through 36 if then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. I'd like to call the band up right now, and I'd like to, I'd like to ask you this. I'd like to ask you, how is your eye test working out? How are you seeing? Are you seeing clearly the Jesus of Scripture? Are you seeing clearly how you're supposed to live, how you're supposed to interact with everybody else, and how you're supposed to worship? Are you seeing clearly? I'm hoping that you are. I'm hoping that you don't let sin infect your vision. I hope that for those who have ears, I pray that they would hear, and I pray that those that have eyes to see, I pray that they'd be able to see. Because that's what it comes down to. Can you see or not? It comes down to this. It comes down to, can you see? Because the Jesus that I serve publicly healed, cast out demons, preached the kingdom of God, preached the gospel, and publicly was hung on a lamppost for all to see. Crucifixion was not only a horrible thing, but it was a visual public thing and I think that the way he died on the cross we see that there is a, a sinner next to him that's, that trusted in Jesus and Jesus said today you'll be with me in paradise the crucifixion was public it was visible 
So can you see God? Can you see Him? I know that some theologians, that, that amazingly they say that, that they, they feel like they can see God in every aspect of our world and how things are made and how children are born and how love is given, and how music is played, and how art is painted. Can you see God? Can you see Him? I pray that your vision is not hindered. I pray that it is not cloudy. I pray that it is not, it is not blinded. I pray that it is not. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a preacher from, from back in the day. He was actually a, do a doctor who became a preacher in England, and he was a great preacher. He said one time that as he was holding his church service, a lady walked in the back door, and she sat down. And this lady looked like she was troubled. But as he later starts to talk to this lady, he finds out that who she was was she was actually a fortune teller medium that lived a few houses down from the chapel. And every Sunday, she kept seeing all these people walking down the sidewalk with smiles on their faces and joy in their hearts, and they're all walking towards this chapel. And so one, one Sunday, she was just feeling, she was feeling ill, so she didn't operate her medium fortune teller psychic stand. And she decided, I'm going to go see. I'm going to go look and see what are these guys doing over here? And she walks into the chapel and she sits down and she hears Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching, fiery preaching, evangelistic preaching. And she, she came to know Jesus Christ. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says that, and for every Sunday after she was there until the day she died, but as Martin talked to her and said, what did you see? She says, well, when I got there, I noticed the power. I've seen that power. But what I saw was that your power was clean. See, she might have been operating in power as the medium, but it was power of darkness. It was grimy, dirty, infection power, but yet... When she hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, she hears power that's clean and true and mighty. She hears power that created everything in existence, power that sustains everything in creation, power of Jesus. This is what she saw, clean power. What do you see today? What do you see today?